Um, but let me start uh, here. I don't know how familiar everyone on the call is with security ratings. Um, so uh, let me start there. Uh, go ahead and share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yep. Great. Um, so th this is our corporate mission to make the cyber world a safer place. And I'll, I'll get back to how we sort of implement that on a day-to-day -day basis in a minute. But uh, like I said, let me start here with uh, sort of a one-on-one on security ratings. Um, I, I myself was totally unfamiliar with this sort of niche within the cy broader cybersecurity world uh, before I joined security, uh, security scorecard. So uh, basically think of your credit score, but for an organization, cyber hygiene. So just like a credit ratings agency is gathering all the publicly available data they can on an individual or a company, um, putting that into an algorithm and spitting out a security score, an objective uh, security score um, that represents an organization, a company or a, or a per individual's likelihood of being able to repay a loan. We're trying to take that same concept to uh, cybersecurity. So we have a uh, network of about 45 sensors all, uh, located all around the world, um, scraping, pinging every single IP address um, and scraping the uh, only external data. We don't go beyond any firewalls uh, or anything like that. Off of those IP addresses, we have an automated attribution system which attributes each IP address to its rightful owner. Uh, it's at about 98% um, accurate right now, and the inaccuracies generally come from uh, things like um, organizations, you know, being bought and sold, and uh, how the corresponding IP addresses transfer over that sort of thing. So it's it's pretty close to 100% accurate at this point. Um, and we put all of that data into our algorithm um, that was developed by our data science team and spit out a security score from one to 100 and a corresponding letter grade from A through F. Um, we have about 12 million organizations rated on our platform right now, uh, public sector and private sector. Um, just to give you a sense of scale, when I joined the company a year ago, we were at 2 million organizations rated. So it took us about eight years to get to 2 million and another year to get to 12 million. And the reason for that acceleration was due to that IP attribution process that we've been able to automate. Um, and because of that, we can anything that we do, we are adding new scorecards every day. Um, and uh, um, uh, because of because of that uh, attribution process, we're able to, if we don't have a score on the platform for an organization that you're looking for, we can generate that in um, five minutes or less. Uh, this is, and I'll give you a, a little tour of the platform in a minute, but this is sort of what that looks like in practice. Um, this is our own security scorecards, own scorecard. As you can see here, we have sort of an overall grade, think of your GPA. And then within that, underneath that, um, we have 10 categories that we group our 95 or so data points into um, that sort of represent your individual class grade, so to speak. Um, so you can see here everything from network security and DNS health um, down to, as I'll show you in a minute, we're monitoring the dark web for hacker chatter um, and, and leaked credentials as well. Uh, you would be surprised how much you can tell just from the outside. Um, but we had our data independently verified over the course of a three year evaluation period. We looked at over 2000 breaches across um, almost 100,000 organizations. And that independent analysis found that uh, F rated companies on our platform are almost eight times more likely to be breached than A rated companies. And even the B rated companies, which we would consider to be pretty good, are um, uh, over two and a half times more likely to be breached than A-rated companies. So put another way, if we can get all those Fs up to As, we would be reducing their likelihood of breach by almost 800%. Um, and, and the reason for that is sort of, you know, if, to, to use an analogy, think of a robber trying to, who wants to rob a house. Um, if they go to the first house, they, you know, the shingles are all in perfect shape on the roof and the windows have bars on them and there's an ADT security sign out front. Um, uh, and then they go to the next house and the shingles are falling off and the windows are broken, the doors are unlocked. Um, that 
that threat actor, that robber is going to, you know, go try and break into the dilapidated house first. And that's kind of what we're showing is your, your hygiene, your cyber hygiene, even just from the outside can tell a lot about um, what, what your, how seriously you are taking your cybersecurity. Um, and uh, the, the other thing I would just mention here is what we're doing, what we're surfacing is basically what amounts to a hacker's eye view of every organization. So this is what the hackers are doing. We're just not opening the door and going in and taking data. I promise you, we don't do that. Uh, I would uh, do not want to go to jail. So I would not be at this company if it's something that we even came close to, but um, it's that same view. So the hackers are doing the same thing. They're scraping the internet. They're using a network of sensors and bots uh, to find the lowest hanging fruit, to find the opening um, in, in organizations, uh, cyber footprints, uh, as I'll, um, uh, show you in a little bit, um, the sort of the, the main use case for our platform is to, to provide that sort of origin story of our company was our, our, our founders were looking for a third party vendor. They were working together at guilt group. Uh, one was the CISO and the other was working for him to online clothing company. They were looking for a credit card fraud prevention monitor. Um, they found a few organizations that they liked, asked for their, you know, your standard security questionnaires, um, pen test results. Everything came back clean on the company that they were leaning towards. And they did a little bit of their own digging and found that this uh, credit card fraud prevention monitor was letting credit card numbers leak on the dark web. Um, and so that was sort of their aha moment. Uh, you know, we're in a world in which, um, over half of all cybersecurity incidents occur through these vendor connections, through these third-party connections, um, and, and when you only look, when you only have that continuous visibility of your own system, you're missing half of your attack surface. Uh, so, with that, um, let me uh, jump over here and give you a look at what the platform looks like, um, sort of what we're talking about, and then uh, jump into a discussion about how. Um, how the, what, what this all means and how it relates to uh, zero trust um, and, and, and procurement and acquisition. So this is uh, what our portfolio, uh, what uh, sort of our, our opening screen looks like. Um, I will, uh, if I could, I'll just use our friends from the government for a minute and take, uh, this is a portfolio that I've created of the CFO Act agencies. Um, what, so down here, you'll see the individual agencies. We can, you can group any organization you want and it's completely customizable into portfolios. So I took these 25 CFO Act agencies um, and grouped them into a portfolio together. What that allows me to do is get an overview of um, uh, of, of the organizations in that portfolio. So we can see who the worst performing companies are, what the most critical issues are across that portfolio, the most common issues you see here, um, and then who's getting better, who's getting worse kind of thing. Uh, and then if I go back here and jump into, we'll pick on OPM today, um, jump into the platform. This is what our scorecard looks like. So this is that screen grab that I showed you before. Uh, as you can see here, like I said, um, we're looking, we regroup our, our data points into 10 overarching categories, everything from network security, DNS health, patching cadence, like I said, all the way down to are there hacker groups um, talking about open ports on your digital assets on the dark web and, and information leak as they're um, are, are we finding leak credentials on the dark web as well? And then each of these is a drop down menu. These are the 95 or so data points that I mentioned. Uh, these are exactly the same across every scorecard. Um, so it's a complete apples to apples comparison. What does change is this overall score is, uh, is a score relative to an organization's, uh, other organizations with similarly sized digital footprints. Um, so if we go over here into the digital footprint, we can see OPM has about 6,000 IP addresses. They're being compared on our platform from a grading, from an overall top level grade perspective to other organizations with plus or minus 6,000 IP addresses. And you can see we have a map here of where those IPs are located around the world. Um, some of these might include, uh, you know, um, individuals from OPM, uh, on a VPN, um, so that's why you might be seeing them um, located around the world. 
uh, and then we can see here the list of their IP addresses that we have for them. Um, if I come back here to the score factors, uh, these each of these where we're finding an issue um, is a link, a clickable link. So you can go in here, uh, get a sort of plain language description of what this means. Um, the reason for this is one of our other founding principles. One of our founding principles was the idea that the cybersecurity discussion needs to go move out of the um, CISO's office and into the boardroom, into the executive suite. Um, and that's why we came up with this very easy to understand. Everybody knows what one through 100 and A through F means. Uh, a is great, F is terrible. Um, B, depending on who your parents are, may or may not be pretty good. Um, and then, you know, down here is a sort of, like I said, a plain language description of what this issue is. Um, we also provide a comparison. So 61% of organizations with similar digital footprints have this issue. Um, so it's not a surprise that we're finding it. What would be concerning to us is uh, that on average, companies of this size, of this digital footprint size, have about five of this finding. And we're seeing eight here at OPM. So that's their score would be dinged for that because they're doing worse than their peers. Um, and then down here, we tell you exactly which IP addresses uh, we're finding this issue on. This is um, also sort of a feedback loop. So companies can come in here, uh, click on these IP addresses and say, actually, we resolved this issue. Um, we have an internal compensating control or this is not our IP address. Um, that sort of thing. And then we will go in and work on the back end with those companies to better understand uh, why they believe they've resolved that issue. We'll do a rescan and work with them. We obviously cannot take everyone's word for it, or everyone would say they've resolved everything. Everyone would have an A, and our scores would be completely meaningless. Um, and then uh, the last thing I'll point out here uh, well, two things. Um, one is our compliance tab. So we have, I, I, call this more of a compliance spot checking um, function. So we have loaded in and, and we can load in pretty much any framework that you want, but we have preloaded a couple of NIST frameworks, uh, the CMMC um, framework and, and a couple of others. And what this allows organizations or, or CISOs or, or others to do, users to do is go in here and say, okay, um, of the, uh, data points that you're collecting, we think that um, this might be an issue uh, of non-compliance with this particular article. We, the reason I call it a spot check is because, as you well know, a lot of these compliance regimes are sort of process-based. You know, do you have a process in place for, for example, your employees to um, update their web browsers within 48 hours of a new patch coming? Well, we can't surface whether you have that piece of paper, but um, what I would argue is that we are surfacing something more important, which is, is that piece of paper being effective? Um, you know, you can go in here and say, that's great that you have a, a process in place to make sure everybody's updating their web browsers, but of the, you know, 2000 um, IP addresses you have, 1500 of them are operating outdated web browsers. So you're, you're either you're, you don't have a process in place or your process sucks. Um, but, but this is, this is sort of what we're surfacing, taking that conversation, um, moving that conversation away from just cybersecurity being a paperwork exercise and actually figuring out uh, if these tools, if these controls are being effective. Um, and then uh, the last thing I'll quickly share here is our history tab. We can do a 12 month look back um, on every organization that we have a, a score on. Uh, and this gives you a sense of sort of how they're performing, how they're getting better or worse over time. So um, uh, users can sort of continuously monitor and, and, and see what this looks like. And then we have a pretty, a, a very detailed event log. We tell you exactly why your score went up or down on a given day. So here you can see we um, identified uh, three new potential issues on July 13th. Um, and, and so that's why, you know, their score uh, was dinged uh, on July 13th. And you can sort of um, select any time period you want and see, get detailed understanding of exactly what's going on in that time period. Uh, so let me pause there. Um, the reason that uh, I was excited to talk to you all today is something that um, we've been talking about a lot with Congress 
uh, and and with agency is is um, despite you know after we, we've had a number of supply chain and vendor incidents in the federal government um, so and and globally really solar winds and Microsoft and 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 all of those um, there is still no requirement for agencies to have and implement a vendor risk management program. Um, and that means more than simply using a, a security rating. We have a, a supply chain risk management framework that we have developed and I'm happy to share as well. Um, at, but it, it's sort of modeled on the um, NIST cybersecurity framework. Uh, so it, it includes, you know, that sort of detect, inspect, response um, kind, of, kind of deal. Um, and, and from a procurement standpoint, what we'd really love to see is for, um, for tools like this to start being used as part of the due diligence process. Um, and especially in a world in which we don't have require, we don't have agencies required to have sort of standing risk management, vendor risk management programs, um, using this on the front end to better understand as a piece of that decision-making process, what an organization cyber hygiene really looks like. Um, so let me pause there uh, and see if there are any questions on that. All right, I guess I've done a pretty good job explaining myself. Um, I, I mentioned the sort of vendor risk issue, but, uh, and, and, you know, just to sort of circle back to uh, zero trust, one of the concerning things for, for me personally, for us as, as an organization, is the fact that we're talking about uh, zero trust architecture, um, but we're, I, I have not really seen a robust discussion about how vendor risk um, is included in that broader discussion about zero trust. And as I said, you know, we're in a world in which over half of cyber incidents occur through vendors. Um, so to not be including that vendor risk piece into a zero trust architecture, I think we're missing um, a large piece of, of, of all vulnerabilities. So uh, um, that's, uh, I think that's it. That's all I have for, for my presentation. Like I said, happy to answer any questions um, or give everyone back a little bit of time.